All right. Hello. Welcome. Come on in, everyone. Get comfortable. We're going to start here in just a couple seconds, but grab your beverage of choice, get cozy, snuggle up with a blanket, and we are going to get started here in just a moment. How about right now? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event space. Um, my name is Ali. Um, I'm your host for this evening, and I am so excited to be introducing Renee Watson, Meg Medina, and Ola Bemisola Rude Perkovich here to discuss two wonderful new middle grade novels, uh, Ways to Grow, Love, which came out today, happy book birthday, <laughs> and Mercy Suarez Can't Dance. Uh, so before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support really is what keeps this place going and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you swing by, grab copies, or if you're not local, we do ship. Shipping is just $3.50 for the first book and a dollar for every book after that. Um, I will be linking books in the chat um, so they should be easy to find. And while you are over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or sign up for our newsletter. It's a uh, weekly update about events, exciting releases, our online book clubs. Um, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest, oh, excuse me, updates and recommendations. Um, and, you know, we have some fun over there on our social media. So definitely go see if there's anything there for you. Uh, so we are here for about an hour. And towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which I very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which is different than the chat box. The chat is great for virtual applause and for connecting with each other and for congratulations. I'm seeing that people have already discovered chat. Hooray. Um, but once it comes time for questions, definitely make sure you put those in the Q&A just so that we can find find them a little bit easier. <laughs> and I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so, so thrilled to introduce Renee Watson, the New York Times bestselling author of Peace and Me Together, which received a Newbery Honor and Coretta Scott King Award, as well as the Ryan Hart series. Love is a revolution at some places more than others. This side of home, what mama left me. Betty Before X and Watch Us Rise, as well as two <laughs> acclaimed picture books, A Place Where Hurricanes Happen and Harlem's Little Blackbird, uh, which was nominated for the NAACP Image Award. She is the founder of I2 Arts Collective, a nonprofit committed to nurturing underrepresented voices in the creative arts. Uh, Ways to Grow Love, which came out today, is the second book in the Ryan and Heart series, which began um, with the New York Times Best Children's Book of the Year, uh, Ways to Make Sunshine, and follows as her family grows and changes during the summer before fifth grade, while Ryan herself navigates complicated friendships and meets new challenges with her signature sunshine. Uh, our next author is the wonderful Meg Medina, the 2019 Newbery Medalist for Mercy Suarez Changes Gears, a Pura Belpre Author Award recipient for Yaki Delgado Wants to Kick Your Ass, and the author of the novels Burn Baby Bird, Burn, and The Girl Who Could Silence the Wind, as well as picture books Mango Abuela and Me and Tia Isa Wants a Car, for which she received the Ezra Jack Keats New Writer Award. Mercy Suarez Can't Dance is a Kirkus Review's most anticipated book of 2021 and brings us back to the wonderful Suarez family as Mercy takes on seventh grade and all the new responsibilities and challenges gr uh, growing up throws her way. And in conversation tonight, I am so thrilled to welcome Ola Bemisola Rudy Perkovich. 
the author of Eighth Grade Super Zero, which was named a notable book for a global society. It doesn't take a genius. Sesame Workshops, Alice and Wonder, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and the forthcoming Operation Sisterhood. She's the co-author of the NAACP Image Award nominee to Naomi's and its sequel, Naomi's Two. Um, she also writes nonfiction, including Above and Beyond, NASA's Journey to Tomorrow, Someday is Now, Clara Looper, and the 1958 Oklahoma City Sit-ins, Saving Earth, Climate Change, and the Fight for Our Future. She is a member of the Brown Bookshelf, an editor of the We Need Diverse Books anthology, The Hero Next Door. So thank you, thank you all so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. Um, if anyone needs anything, give me a shout. I will be listening. My name is Ali. That goes for everyone in the audience as well. I will be keeping an eye on chat. Uh, don't forget to throw your questions in the Q&A. And with that, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank you, Third Place Books. And thank you, Meg and Renee, for allowing me to join in this conversation with you. I'm excited to talk. And I would love to dig right into these beautiful books. Um, both Ryan and Mercy are just such dynamic, beautiful, complex characters. And Renee, I'd like to ask you a little bit about Ryan. Did you expect from the beginning to be telling her story over a series of books? This is the second book in the series. When you started, uh, did your relationship with Ryan change from the first to the second book? And how do you think about her growing and changing over time? Oh, so first, hi, it's so good to see you. And, and thank you for being a part of this to celebrate tonight. And hi, everybody. I see all the love in the chat. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so when I first started talking about doing Ryan Hart, I did think of it as a series. And we at the time thought it would be two books. Um, and so I had in my mind what her growth would be over a two book series and how I would, you know, do a follow up. And in the middle of writing that follow up, Ways to Grow Love, um, Bloomsbury extended the series. So now it's four books. And so I am thinking right now, okay, when I found that out, I was like, okay, if there's going to be two more books after this, how do I end it to where you know that more is coming, but it feels like a satisfying ending. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to spend more time with her. She has grown from the first book to the second book as fourth graders do when they enter fifth grade is such this leap of kind of maturity and um, a different way of seeing things. So in this second book, she is kind of putting into practice some of the lessons that she learned um, in the first book. I think she is starting to kind of get her, her bearings a little bit and learn how to stand up for herself and um, kind of put her grandmother's advice into practice. So yeah, yeah, it's been really fun being with her and watching her grow yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and figure things out on her own. And, you know, also get closer to her brother. Their relationship is evolving yeah. as they get older too. So he's not as big a, as a pest as he was in the first <laughs> Yeah, Meg, Mercy's family goes real deep too. Where did Where did she start for you? Well, she started in a story very similar to, first of all, hello, I'm so excited <laughs> to be with the two of you. Like this doesn't feel like a chore on any level I at know, all. So I was funny. like, is it time for me to be talking with my friends yet? So, <laughs> oh, and hello everybody. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. So um, Medici started in an anthology, like the one that you um, edited for We Need Diverse Books. Ours was the first one in that series yeah. called Flying Lessons and Other Stories. And the story was Soul Painting Inc. And she was um, a character who, you know, the daughter of a guy who runs a painting company. And that day he's uh, going, he's taking her and her older brother uh, on a paint job with him. And they're going to paint the gymnasium in a trade for a tuition reduction at her at her new school. And so that story, you know how short stories are, they're just sort of like impressionist paintings, right? They're just dabs of color. And so to, to suggest the world, right? And so I was really just looking at, at economic disparity, mm -hmm. um, feeling out of place, feeling 
disrespected, looking at your parents with new eyes, sometimes with disappointment, not really understanding. Like I was really looking at all this, this little sliver of time. So interestingly, unlike Renee, who, who knew that she's gonna be writing two books, I really thought the story was it. And then it became, it wouldn't leave me, she wouldn't leave me. And she became a novel. And now, you know, at the end of that novel, I thought I would be done and I wasn't done either. Um, so mm -hmm. I wrote, wrote the second one. And as we speak, you know, all day I've been writing what will be the last of the Mercy mm -hmm. books, which is the, oh. the next one. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a journey. I, I don't know if you feel this way, Renee, like you feel like, for me, the Suarezes are now real, real, real people. Yeah. Right. And, and Roli and her antagonism with her, her brother and her love for her brother and Lolo, like all of that feels real. And, and then the, the, the pressure is not only to write stories that in and of themselves, like in every book there, that they're good, but that you can also bring the whole series in for a satisfying and good landing for kids. You know, that, that has ended up being something that I, I'm giving a lot of thought to. Yeah, yeah. it's challenging to think about mm -hmm. um, how do I make readers want to continue with this character, you know, and make it where they're on the journey with her and they're curious about her and they can't wait for the next book. It's challenging to think about that. And like you said, you get, or I get so attached to my characters. I talk about them like they're real. Like I'm, I I'm acting like they're making decisions. I'm like, well, you wrote that though. So you did exactly. that. Exactly, I know. But sometimes it really does feel <laughs> like, uh, like yeah. Ryan is telling me who she wants to be and how she wants to show up on the page in a way that when I'm plotting or thinking about what I'm about to write, once I actually sit down and start the scene, it just starts to take turns and, and unexpected things come up, which is the best part of writing, you know, which is also why I don't plot too much because my writing style is kind of letting the characters come to life and take shape. And um, yeah, so it's been really fun to see her grow and develop in ways that I didn't think about when I first started um, writing her. You know, what's hard also is that they're getting older, Yeah, but, but right. the reader is staying you, right it's a middle grade reader right so it's in a certain age group and how we mature the character and still make them relevant and relatable to that age group like all of that stuff but yeah anyway, <laughs> all of that but I I feel the same way and I love Ryan Hart oh, I just you. I loved her in the first book I love her in the second book she I want to be her friend she's just <laughs> she's really funny and that brother and you're another like, the the brother in it doesn't take a genius. I'm gonna throw yes. this right in. Like, I know. Yeah, I know. We, I have it over here too. We all have brothers. Like, do we have brothers in real life? I have no brother. I, I don't do. have a brother. I have a brother. You don't um, have a brother. I do. Yes, he's the oldest you of do. of us. Yeah. So you know, I don't know where you know. <laughs> I, I think this is maybe like my fantasy brother. Like what? Who? The what I imagine a great brother is, which is like part test, part guide part i don't know what do you think i mean when you were <laughs> writing luke in your book how how did that go i know i love that this, this cover is, is, this is everything Demet, right this, this is cover Demet. is that's gordon james genius so beautiful like, it's just beautiful like i look at it and just want to cry with joy because it, it is beautiful and it's it's interesting writing families they they do become very real and i can even imagine sort of ryan family Family and Mercy's family being friends and sort of interacting with each other. I can picture that. I wonder how much for both of you, these characters are not for your own families and your own lives and your own selves and how much you maybe consciously or subconsciously and realize it later sort of think about what parts of you and your lives you put into these stories and into these characters' lives. Mm. Renee, what do you think with Ryan? Um, so Ryan, I'll say this for, for those who don't know, Ryan is actually loosely based off of my goddaughter, whose name is Ryan. And um, I was watching <laughs> her cooking one day. She loved to make up recipes and, and ask us to be the taste testers of all of her concoctions. And that's where I got the idea of this 
fun spirited girl who loves to cook. That was kind of like the first nugget of, of writing Ryan. And so, so much of um, the dynamic is kind of like, who is the real Ryan as a person? She's so sweet. She's a leader. She's so kind and thoughtful. So I wanted to make sure um, those elements showed up in Ryan, but then in everything else is, you know, fiction and I'm using my imagination to make it up. And I am going back to childhood a little bit and thinking about, okay, what was it like to play at Alberta Park? And what was it like to um, have that friendship drama when you're in the fourth and fifth grade? Friendship is so yeah. everything. And then also can be so heartbreaking <laughs> depending on the day. Um, so I just was tapping into a lot of memories, but Ryan, the character, is very different for me. She's super competitive. I am not. Um, she is um, a little more, um, she's always, always looking for the joy and looking for the way to bring sun and to make things better. And I don't know yeah. that when I was younger, I was that way. I think I was just like, well, this is how it is. And I wasn't necessarily <laughs> negative, but I wasn't also intentionally <laughs> trying to change things and you know I wouldn't be yeah. the girl making the sun and putting it on the walls because I'm sad that it's raining outside and that's Ryan so yeah she's a little bit of me but I really just you know made up this character based off of some childhood memories some of the real Ryan and then a lot of the young girls that I know too I wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that um, a healthy black family was on the page so I even in thinking about Ryan's mm -hmm. dad um, I just wanted to like pay honor to the men um, in my community and in my life who have been great fathers. I wanted to show what that looks like um, and just give her a lot of love in the community and the people around her. So that very much is, is me. I grew up with this amazing black community who um, not just my immediate family, but the neighbors and the people at church and everybody looking out for you. So I wanted to create that in the story as well. You did. I, yeah, I have, really speaking of a little piece of Renee, can I share a screen? <laughs> because I have a little piece of Renee um, and a little piece of Meg at the same time. Do you guys see this now? This is, are you able to see it? I see it. I see it. <laughs> okay, here's, here's Renee <laughs> and here's me. Oh, and we're geez. both sort, I think this is somewhere in the, third grade mine was in the 70s I'm sure yours was not in the 70s but early 80s I love this cute. <laughs> my gosh the writers before we the were writers. So cute. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing here we found this uh, we were doing another event together and we happened to, to <laughs> each have like these pictures you know picture day is just was fatal for picture me <laughs> that might have been one year. of the best ones I had <laughs> <laughs> I know I know there's a reason why Mercy Suarez changes gear starts on picture day mm. and it's because it's always such a trauma or it was a traumatizing thing it's a fraught know? day yeah yeah fraught with tension oh. yeah so would you have been keep friends the with... picture pardon me <laughs> would you have been friends with Mercy you think when you were in seventh grade I oh you and... know I was so many different people as I was growing up Right. Mm. And so as a kid, as the girl in that picture that I just showed you, I was I was a pretty happy kid. I, you know, my family, the Suarez family is a lot happier than my actual family was. Mm. And that is that is the truth. I was very loved. I had tias that loved me and abuelos and abuelos. I, I don't want to ever suggest that I wasn't loved. I knew that I was loved and I had good people in my life. I also had traumatized people in my life mm. who had lost their country. We were struggling with, with poverty. There were mental health issues sometimes with folks. And so there was a lot, there mm. was a lot going on. So when I write the Suarez's, some of the harder things are from life. And then some of the more joyful things are the things that I am very happy to say that I have known in my life and the life that I built. Mm -hmm. Like I have, I'm married to Javier Menendez, who's a wonderful father, right? Who's a wonderful Latino father. Um, and I got to draw him, you know, in some way. I, and, you know, I just drew, drew a family that was extended and supportive, even 
in all the Budinsky ways and all the ways that our families make us, you know, our lives difficult when we're kids, right? Because everybody's raising you. That's the thing that drives Mercy crazy, right? It's like, yeah. it's no holds barred. Everybody can tell you what to do at any moment. And um, I wanted to, to draw that even, and, and I wanted to capture like the funny and light moments and put them right next to the really hard moments because yeah. I think that's what happens. That's what happens with, yeah. with kids. Yeah, I think you do yeah. that so well, Meg. Like I, I love, I've always loved your writing for that reason. You don't shy away from uh, trusting that young people can handle both and that it doesn't have to be all happy, but just funny moments, which you are really good at comedy and having the funny moments, um, but, and just the tender moments too. Like you're so good at writing these really tender moments between friends and family and also the struggle and the pain and the hardship of being afraid of what's happening to a loved one who, who, who's sick um, and just life in general, right? And so I, I've always admired and respected that about your work and think that it's important that our young people have books that have both in the same book, not necessarily one or the other, but that allow them to see you can still have joy even when things are not so great. And that that really is preparing you for the rest of your life, that there were oh all my so many things going on at one time. And that's just, yeah. that is living. And I think it, it helps prepare them for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think when we're writing, and you and I both write into this space of, of families who are not necessarily economically, you know, in a, in a strong place, right? And so yeah. I hate to further afflict them in a story, right? Like to I it's possible to have that to 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 struggle financially and belong to a loving wonderful community it's, I, yes. it's possible it happens every day and we don't you know the stereotype isn't that and so we're writing sometimes in the face of that like we're writing in in response to um, a very narrow story and vision of people you know yeah I, I often say I was we were economically poor, but we were wealthy in so many other ways. We had lots of love, we had lots of talent, we had lots of care and compassion, we had lots of fun. Like there were so many other parts of my childhood. And so, yes, I'm definitely trying to write that family that they might be struggling financially. The dad has lost his job and then now he's working um, the night shift at a at lower paying job. So they're struggling a bit, but that doesn't change the fact that they love each other and that there's other things that they can do together also, um, even though they don't have a lot of money. And I think, I didn't even, I mean, I wrote Ways to Make Sunshine before the pandemic, but it came out right at the beginning of, of lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking about all the young people whose lives were going to drastically change because of their parents now having to maybe they lost their job or working less hours or what, you know, and yeah. that, that doesn't mean that those parents <laughs> don't care about their kids or don't love them. And yeah. so, yeah, Bimmy, you were asking a moment ago about what are parts of your childhood that show up in the book. And I don't know that I intended that. I really yeah. kind of wrote the dad losing his job because I was trying to pay homage to the Ramona series in some way. So I wanted to pull a few things from that. But yeah. then I was like, oh, my life also <laughs> wasn't necessarily yeah. my father losing his job, but it was that we were growing up and without a whole lot. And I always say, my mom made a way out of no way. We still figured out a way to, to laugh and love and, and we had each other. It's funny that process of discovery, like while you're writing and the things that come up that maybe you didn't intend to come up. And today I was um, working on another book and I came across this um, and I'm curious to know what you both think about it. It's a James Baldwin quote where he says, the whole language of writing for me is finding out what you don't want to know, what you don't want to find out, but something forces you to anyway. And I'm wondering in the process of working on these very much kind of stand up and cheer books in a lot of ways, because you're just rooting for both Mercy and Ryan the whole way. And they are joyful books and that deep joy that exists alongside challenges and sadness sometimes. But were there things that you found out that were a little hard while you were writing or that, that challenged you that maybe were a little uncomfortable? 
Meg, what do yeah, you think? I, I think that the Mercy had moments where she was mean and thoughtless. Mm -hmm. And I think that kids have moments when they're mean and thoughtless. Good kids have moments like that. And so the question is, like, how do they fix it? How do you how do you fix it when you've made a mistake, when you've dug, dug a hole? And I've I've explored this. Certainly, my YA has has taken some deep dives in that in those areas. But you know, I I think that the process of of growing up isn't a straight line, right? And and you know, by definition, I think they're going to make a lot of foul ups and they're going to unintentionally hurt people. They're going to be hurt, and sometimes they're going to hurt others. So how they can forgive themselves, how they can forgive mm -hmm. other people, how they can create boundaries and how they can respect other people's boundaries, right? All of that is, 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 is discovered. And so I, you know, there were moments certainly in this book where, um, you know, mercy was meaner than I would have liked or, um, mm -hmm. you know, there were, and there will be more moments like that, unfortunately, <laughs> um, yeah. where uh, she puts herself first, which is um, natural for the age sometimes, right? The, the focus is, you know, what they want in that moment, what, what's going to feel good to them in that moment. And um, delaying that or thinking of somebody else first, like those those are our hard concepts that they have to practice and they they do it with mistakes. What do you think, Renee? Yeah, I, I love that quote um, that you read mm. from James Baldwin. I'm thinking about the times in the book that were hard for me um, is when Ryan is, is either doubting what is true about herself, right? So her family is always loving her really they're they're affirming her so much you're a leader be who we named you to be you're beautiful you're smart you know they're always speaking affirmations to her and then she gets into uh situations with friends and she will self-doubt like well am i who my family am i who they say i am am mm. i beautiful am i smart um can i stand up to this person who's mistreating me like kind of do i have the right to do that so it takes her some time to find her way a little bit. In the first book, she has a, a very embarrassing moment about her hair. Um, she's the only black girl at a, a pool party. It get, her hair gets wet and in the pool and she's really embarrassed and she's being teased. And then what does she do in that moment? Like, and I remember being like, I don't want, I don't want to go there. I don't want her to have to even think about that. But I was like, well, it's realistic fiction. So that's a real thing that little girls are, are thinking about their body, their looks, their body image, um, teasing and bullying and all of that. And then in, in Ways to Grow Love, she has a moment where she needs to stand up for herself and it takes her a minute to, to do it. And, and then it takes her a minute to be kind. So like uh, for her in thinking about um, Mercy, who's like having to think about um, the things that Meg was just talking about, Ryan is, how do I forgive people when they've wronged me? Yeah. And when I feel like they haven't been their best selves, yeah. right? Can I, can't I just write them off? Like, can I just ignore that yeah. person? Um, but you can't, yeah. especially if it's going to be someone in sure. your friend group, right? <laughs> so she's trying to navigate um, boundaries and like, okay, you're my friend, but maybe you're not my best friend. And I, you know, and, but I can still be nice to you. And how do I, how does she navigate all of that? And I, I remember friendship being really hard to figure out when I was that age of, mm -hmm. of how not to just be like, we're either best friends or we're enemies. Like there's so much room in the middle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but oh you my don't gosh. always know that when yeah. you're that age that you can, you can yeah. like someone and not be their best friend. So yeah, she's trying to figure all of that out. And those were the hardest scenes to write just because it's just sad and painful and icky. And I just wanted her to, have only fun but I thought well that's not realistic I gotta have yeah. a little bit of drama so that's where I built the tension those are the times when it is for me to sort of get out of the way of the story and get out of the way of the work when I really want them to 
just do what I want them to do (laughs) or be who I want them to be and not be who they actually are. (laughs) And it can, it can really be a struggle and it can be a struggle sometimes. Emmett, Emmett, Emmett was (laughs) hard. Emmett was hard. Yeah. That kid. Yeah. I was like that as I was writing. I was just like, what are you doing, yeah. Emmett? So there were there times when I'm like, okay, but this is exactly what he would do. And I can't, I'm I'm not his mom. And I can't even tell, <laughs> <laughs> I can't even like be the mom in the story. Um, but it's, it's hard. It is, yeah. it's really hard. I think sometimes it's hard to, like during, over the past year, I was writing a very, what's meant to be a very joyful book and um, a couple of other books that were meant to be joyful and happy. And I was thinking about giving something joyful and happy to readers. And both of these books, Ways to Grow Love and Mercy Suarez Can't Dance are joyful and uplifting books in a lot of ways. And I'm wondering how it was for you kind of writing these stories during a period of time that was not particularly joyful uh, for us in a lot of ways and how that impacted either the way that you wrote maybe the content of what you wrote how how what happened Mm. yeah it's been something so I wasn't I think I was finishing up either I was finishing up mercy or it was mercy to the can't dance and it was already going into production so I didn't have to do the heavy creative lifting I don't think during COVID I had to, um, books were coming out, like Evelyn Del Rey is moving away, was coming out. Mm-hmm. And as it happened, it's about missing friends and, and so on. So I had really worried about that book, interestingly, because it was gonna come out during the election year. Yeah. And I just thought this country is exhausted and we're in these contentious uh, debates and, what book is going to have any sort of, you know, coming out in the fall, I just saw failure. I thought it was gonna be just a quiet book that nobody would recognize. But it ended up that a book about two friends who can't see each other anymore, who truly love each other. And a book that, you know, looks at at intersections of identity within Latina uh, community with two Latinx girls. Um, did resonate. And and so I was able to find some joy in that. It was hard to lift off on this third book during that time because I found like I couldn't concentrate. Like I couldn't sometimes go in really deeply because I kept looking at the news or I kept um, just anxiety, just anxiety was was, um, gripping me. In the beginning, I felt like I tried to keep writing the way we tread water, right? To stay, yeah. you're not going anywhere, but you're just keeping air, yeah. right? Um, so it's better now. It's better now. I feel like I'm back to forward motion, but I don't know. It, I've just been so worried. I yeah. have just felt so worried, not just about health things, but like about, about children, yeah. about goodness, about moving forward in generations. Like I've just, I've, I've been worried in a way I, I can't ever remember being worried before. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, it was hard. Um, I think like thinking about the writing process, I hand wrote more of this book than I've ever done for other books. Mm-hmm. So normally when I'm stuck, like in the revision process, if I'm stuck, I'll just handwrite a few scenes and it kind of gets me back into the groove of the story. I don't know why that is. There's something about being intimate with the page that unlocks something Mm -hmm. for me versus typing. And so that kept happening. Like I was like, oh, I'm writing again today. Like I I just couldn't sit at my computer and type out a story. I had to um, journal and kind of write that way. Um, And I mean, I was, I was so sad, like like Meg was saying, so worried about loved ones, worried about, frankly, myself. Um, 
Black Lives Matter protests were happening. All of that was going on while I'm working on this book. And so I just kept trying to hold on to thinking about, especially like I'm writing for all young people and all my readers, but I am first and foremost writing for young black girls. And yeah. so I just kept thinking about trying to just hug them and just trying to love on them and trying to yeah hopefully be maybe a breath of fresh air even if they're mm -hmm. reading with their family or with uh, I was thinking about teachers a lot who maybe you know sometimes my books are are a little heavier and they're about a social issue where you can go deep into the intersections of race class and gender and all these you know conversations mm -hmm. but I also think sometimes you just kind of need to exhale and have a moment mm -hmm. um with young people where you can just be and and laugh and so I just I remember brainstorming a list of like, what are just fun things that Ryan can do? Like roller coasters, uh, balloon, uh, water balloon fight, you know, just think, things like that so that I could make sure there was gonna be joy in this book because I knew we would still be in this situation and I wanted them to have something to read um, that was hopefully bringing them joy and not just helping them focus on, on the painful stuff. But it was hard, it's been really hard to create during this time, um, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was also hard, I think, in, in terms of realistic fiction because, right, if we're talking about realism, so is anybody gonna write a book about this time? You know, about yeah. the mask wearing and going to school on a screen and tuning out or whatever, you know, whatever it is, whatever the story is, like I, I there was that question too, should I, like, mm -hmm. am I, putting this yeah. in here like uh, what happens to Rolly at college Does he, is he sent home right like what happens and so there's stuff like that too you know so realism is tricky that way right because you still yeah. you're doing all this world building to approximate this world but of course you are you know it's secretly in control not secretly but in our mind it's secret <laughs> secretly in control of this world right and but there are all these choices right of what what you want to represent and what you want to put in there or not ultimately i i i didn't i i did put things like hand washing like i did did things yeah. like that but i didn't go mm. full on into into masks and so on i don't know i may it'll be interesting to see i think maybe about what it. we need is time i'm yeah. sorry yes that again? Yeah, I, I've been, I was thinking about it a lot. It's funny, I ended up making a major change to Operation Sisterhood um, last summer just because I was so, so sad about just everything. And I kept thinking about what sort of living in all the sadness was going to do to children. So say like a year from now, two years from now, and like, so I'm thinking like, oh, when this book com comes out and like, what do I want to give readers? And there was a plot point and just something that happened in the story that wasn't like a, a bad thing, but it was also something sad that I felt like I just didn't want to give readers that um, after everything that we've all been through and just thinking about that a lot. And it, it, it was definitely, it was challenging. Yeah. yeah, I mean, think about of the golden age of Hollywood. I'm sorry. No, I yeah. just, I, I think about that a lot. What am I giving readers? And by the time they read it, like how much distance maybe do they need before we are now then processing it? Like we're still in it. So for me, yeah. I don't know that I could write about, about it right now because it's still happening and I need a little bit of time. And then there are other stories that I'm like, yeah, I can write about this and it's heavy but it's either happened so many times that there's some distance or there's enough um, uh, enough emotion to pull from that, that lets me as the writer be a writer, right? And not mm -hmm. writing a personal essay. Cause, cause that's the <laughs> other thing, I needed a break. Like I, yeah. I remember having this conversation um, with my editor of just like, yeah, we write the book right? If it's a series, but you write the book, then you go on a book tour and you're talking about the book to young people, mm -hmm. to educators, um, you know, all, all kinds of people. And then I am living this life. I am a Black woman in the United States of America. So to constantly talk about it, write about it, and live it, 
it is a lot. And so sometimes yeah. I just need to lean into the joy a little bit more and yeah. give myself, a, you know, just a reminder that that is also happening too. Um, and yeah, so that all was going through my mind while writing this series. Writing, yeah. yeah. And leaning on you, both of you <laughs> texting <laughs> and calling. And, you know, I mean, I always mm-hmm. say you have to have a community of, of people who are going to hold you up and yeah. support you and push you or just let you vent because there's a lot going on in the world all the time. So yeah, I think I made it and, and feel good about what I'm putting out in the world. But a lot of that is because of the community that I'm a part of. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I I have, I have phone calls that I make all the time that Mm -hmm. I, that feel like lifelines to me. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Just checking in with the people who are, who, other writers, people we love who, uh, who just remind us that we are part of something. I, I don't know, I, I feel like we're part of something that puts light in, right? Good goodness in, and is so child focused and hope focused. Mm-hmm. So it, it does me good to, to remind myself to stay in, in contact and in conversation, even if we're not talking about anything specific you know like what are you doing today like it could be something as simple as that or to share a burden sometimes you know Mm, things that you know all of us lost people this year many of us did it was you know so it's it was it it was a comfort but i that's one of the things i love about the kid lit community yeah yeah and i want that we want that so much for our readers our that comfort and that community and that support and both of you have written in these books about these sort of very dynamic and powerful girls and young women. And I think about how we are, we very often encourage girls and young women of color, especially to speak up and to, to be strong and to be excellent and magical and to be a whole lot of things. And sometimes I feel like there's a fine line between empowerment and encouragement and burdening and um, sort of putting expectations and putting too much on our young people and on our readers. And I wonder how you think about that um, in relation to the work that you do. Renee. Mm, That is such a good question. I I think about it a lot and I, I have to pull back because I am yeah. It is my kind of go-to to to like write girl characters who are speaking back to the world and standing up against injustice and using their art to fight, 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 right? And so, yeah, especially for Ryan, one, it was a little bit easier because of her age. You know, she's in the fourth yeah. grade or in this Ways to Go Left, she's in the fifth grade. Um, so there's a little bit that she just can't do by way of her age. And so it also gave me room and space to make sure I let her just live her life with not having to teach anyone anything, not have to be the spokesperson or somebody's cheerleader. Um, Even in her parents naming her Ryan, which means king, she's a leader, they want her to be a leader. I am trying to explore what does leadership look like in smaller ways, not the obvious you know, way that we think of as a leader. She's not the kid who wants to get on the mic and make a speech. She's not that, she's not that person at all. Um, And so how is she showing up within her friend group or at her, you know, family or with her grandma and cooking for people and volunteering and going to feed the homeless? Um, Things like that is is kind of where I have her thinking about how she wants to show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's because she wants to, and because she feels passionate about those things and it's coming from within her instead of like I should be doing this because of whatever fill in the blank right so I wanted to take all that pressure off of her to feel like she has to be something or speak up for anybody else right now it's just about her finding her voice and figuring out who she wants to be and it's been really fun letting her experiment and figure that out on the page yeah what do you think? I, I think I was coming at it from another place. I was coming, so my, in my upbringing, my mom really encouraged, she, my mother really encouraged me to be 
quiet, which was pointless endeavor, but she tried to, to get me to be quiet and um, amenable and respectable and not cause waves and, you know, just that, she, you know, said una muchacha fina, right, to be a fine, quiet young lady, right? And so the problem was that the life that I was li living, you know, I grew up in New York City in the 70s. It was just not, that was not going to equip me for what I was, was facing. And so my own growth as a, as a young woman was to find a voice when your family was telling you, you can think those things, but you need to keep your lips closed and your eyes down and, and go forward, right? So when I write Mercy, I try to write her snark and her internal dialogue is really where I, I see her shaping her own power. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the things that she blurts out, but often I think, you know, in studying her as a character, it's what she's, the, the hypocrisies that she's pointing out, the ridiculous decisions that adults are making, the, the, the things that she's not saying to Edna that she feels very deeply, but that she will, you know, on page 300 perhaps say to Edna. So it's, um, it's a process of, of finding, finding her voice and, and saying, um, saying her truth. And, you know, it, I don't know. It had to, it had so many dimensions. That silence had so many dimensions in my life. It was, you know, it's machismo. Um, it was, uh, you know, the immigrant sort of experience. It was all of those things. Just be yeah. quiet and and be decent and likable. And that's a really hard thing, right, to carry around. Yeah, and so. I still. I said, I don't know if you feel this way, Renee and Bemi, but you know, we move through the world a lot, the three of us doing a lot of stuff for the community at large as well, right? For our own careers and our own books, but also for other authors and, and for the wider um, Kidlet community. And sometimes that's a lot. Sometimes that's a lot. And sometimes that's really exhausting. And, and so as, a, as an author, I struggle with that also, like trying to find the boundaries of, of when I have to rest and when I have to pull back and, and um, encourage others to, you know, go, go forward and, and do what they have to do. And also when I have to say things that feel uncomfortable and, and I, I hear my mom saying, shh, you know, don't you start trouble, right? Yes. And I'm, and sometimes you have to start good trouble, right? You have yeah. to say harvest. And so it's a, you're never far from your truth, right? You're never far yeah. from all of the experience of growing up. It's funny you say that. I feel like in a lot of ways, writing for young people makes me a better adult. Because I'm like, well, if I'm going, if I'm asking young people <laughs> to think about these things and, and you know, I'm, I'm creating this character who's kind and thoughtful and who is trying to have the balance of taking care of herself and others and all of that, then I have to be that way, right? Because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to put work out in the world that I'm not living up to. And so I, it has been interesting to learn from my characters <laughs> and to get yeah. these reminders of like, oh, <laughs> I need to work on that myself or, oh, yeah, I, I can have fun. I can just play and it's okay to take a break and it's okay to not work yourself so hard or feel like you have to, um, you know, be in everything and, sh and show up for everyone. You have to show up for yourself too. So yeah, I'm, I am constantly reminded of that um, when writing these characters and trying to make them, you know, be these ideal girls on the page. I'm also thinking about what does it look like in my own life? For sure. And it keeps yeah. you close to who that person you were when you were their age and that and yeah. it just reminds you of the vulnerability and like giving yourself room as an adult writer you may you know you're trying to control the story and have them do yeah. things and have things go a certain way and have them be a certain way but it, it's such a good reminder I think our work to 
give children room to to grow and to give them the grace to be who they are and be all the different people that they are and the people who make mistakes and the people who take risks, the people who don't take risks, the people who are loud, the people who are quiet and sort of go through all of those different things. I think writing for children really helps remind me to do that and not have sometimes unrealistic expectations of uh, young people to not be human. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, for sure, yeah. I know that Allie would like to oh, jump in. Yeah. By magic, she appeared. <laughs> She's back. <laughs> I hate so much to end this wonderful conversation, but we do have some questions. So the first question is from Emmett Watson, who I happen to know is eight, um, and says, will you write a book with the name Emmett in it? <laughs> and I won't make you answer that live, <laughs> but just to think about <laughs> <laughs> it says Summit. <laughs> there it is. Yes. Um, so this next question is from Gabriella Leader, and I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, but she says, hi, Renee, nice to see you again. We met on a call with the South Orange Library. You sent me an advanced copy, so I already know the new book. Um, <laughs> I loved it. My question is, is, if you were Ryan, what would you do next in life? Next in life, um, if I were Ryan, so Ryan is in the fifth grade, um, and when we're ending this story, it is it is fall. So for Ryan, what I would do next in life is um, enjoy winter break is coming up, um, <laughs> and so I would be so happy to have a break from school and spending time with my family, who I in real life miss so much. Um, and yeah, I think she would be getting ready for the holidays and being excited about being with her family and just keep, you know, living and enjoying Portland. I'm trying to take you all as readers through the four seasons that Portland has. And so Ryan gets to go on these adventures. So we just have summer and uh, ways to grow love. And in the next book, it will be late fall, early winter. So we'll get to see some of um, Portland's beautiful um, winterscapes in this next book. So yeah, that's what she's doing next. Loving herself and her family and having fun in Portland. I hope she's baking. Yeah, she's she baking. You know, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Definitely baking. And, and, doing... and listen, tell your publicist you need a whole Ryan Hart cookbook series. <laughs> yes. I was gonna say, there. yes. Publicist out there, it's a great idea. It's a great Ryan Hart cookbook. Idea. Yes. Yeah, I'd have that. I want it. I, I love want that, that idea. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, I'll be sending an email. I'm going to say, Meg Medina said. Meg Medina said. Okay. So um, our next question is from Mark, uh, who says, maybe you just touched on this, but I loved what Renee said about her character working herself up to various things, defending herself, speaking up, etc. Seeing that on the page is su such a gift to the reader, but often the hardest to write. Do any of you have to work yourself up to that? Uh, what do you do to protect yourself when you harvest and write the cringy bits? Mm. There's no protection. <laughs> that yeah. the cringy bits are the cringy bits, man. I mean, this is the thing. The 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 risk is actually when you do protect yourself from discomfort when you're writing. That's much riskier because then what you're risking is writing something that's going to ring false. Yeah. So, I my feeling is that you have to lay yourself there. You have to really go in there and just write the thing that makes you uncomfortable, the word, the scene, the thought. Um, you can edit, you could do all kinds of things later to, to you know, address any misgivings you have about something you've written. But, but I think in the, certainly at, when you first approaching it, don't, don't back down from the cringe, step right into it. Yeah, I agree. I put it, I would rather have to edit myself later in revision and pull back versus not giving enough in those first early drafts. So I might overwrite something just to get all the emotion out. 
and then go back and like, okay, I need to, you know, finesse it a little bit more. But my first drafts are very rough <laughs> drafts. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's more emotion than plot even, because I'm just kind of getting in tune with what my character is feeling. And I think, I think that's what makes stories good. So I, I, I lean into that first and foremost, and then go back and figure out plot and how it's all going to make sense. So I encourage you to go there, even if it is hard or hard on you, <laughs> go there and then go talk to someone about it or a therapist also. Um, when you're processing, and I'm being, I'm joking, but I'm serious. Like sometimes when you're writing heavy things, you have to process some of that. And if you don't have people in your life to do that with, I, I do think it's important to, um, to talk that through with someone. So I would also give that <laughs> advice. Sometimes I also have to just put it aside for a while. There's st There's been certain times when it was just too hard and too much at a particular time. And I just had to put it aside for a while. And sometimes with um, student, uh, with young writers and artists, I do say that, you know, sometimes you're writing things that are personal and sometimes you are thinking about things that are private and you never have to share something private. Um, you can share something personal and that's important and that's meaningful to you. But if there's something that even as you're working or after you write it that you feel is private, then it's private and that's okay. You don't have to feel like you need to share it with, with anyone. I love those answers. Thank you. So an anonymous attendee um, would like to know how you approach writing about situations with outcomes that teach about alternatives to traditional or normalized ways that things are done in real life. <laughs> we're but we're all I stunned. Know. I don't know that I understand. I'm sorry. Question. I don't know that <laughs> I understand. Back. Stand I'm back. Question. I'm back. <laughs> I I don't entirely. <laughs> I anonymous attendee, if you're still listening, we would love some clarification yes. about what you mean. <laughs> but let's let's hop to the next question real quick. Um, do you spend a lot of time with children to listen so that the authenticity of your writing remains fresh? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have young people in your life, watch TV shows where the characters are young. You know, there's so many ways. Read other books um, that are in the grade level that you're trying to write for. There's many ways to get the thoughts and mannerisms and characteristics of young people. So yeah, if you don't have them readily at your, you know, in your life, there's other ways to get those voices in your head too. I don't know. I think it's a combination. I re I watch people really carefully, even when I don't realize that I'm doing it. I people's mannerisms. I mm. for some reason I really note them and they stick with me. Um, but the voice that I'm calling up are the voices of the kids that I was a kid with. So okay. even though the vocabulary is different and so on, the um, the emotional life and the, the way of looking at things, I just sort of teleport back into being 10. Yeah. I, and I, I wish I could tell you how that happens. I really don't know, but I'm able to do that. Um, <laughs> I'm able to just dial, it's like a little dial, you know, like a little time traveler. And I'm, and then I'm there and then I'm reacting like I'm 10 and I'm thinking like I'm 10 and I'm just, 10 that day mm -hmm. I do that too talk about cringy yeah, yeah so. I, do, I definitely do yeah. that too. and it's fun I yeah. don't know it's fun it's something we've got a bunch more questions here but we are getting to the end of our evening so I'm going to do just one more um and I think this is a great one because I this is kind of combines 
my question, my last question too. So Sunday would like to know, well, first of all, says thank you for this inspiring conversation and all of your great work. Um, what's a story or a kind of story you would love to write, but that you haven't attempted yet? And I'm going to loophole on, um, what are you actually working on next? And what can we, what can we keep an eye on on the horizon for each of you? All right, keep going. Um, what am I working on? So I'm working on the third book, the Ryan Hart series. I literally was writing that earlier today. So that's what I'm working on. And I've already forgot the first part of that. Oh, what do I want to write that I haven't done yet? Um, outside of Kitlet, I, I, I want to one day write um, a movie script um, and a play. I, I used to write plays when I was younger and used to do a lot of theater work. And so I'd love to get back into theater at some point in my career, um, but that's probably way far away because um, I have a lot of books to finish right now. Um, I'm working on the third Mercy book. I have my first chapter book comes out in June. It's on Sonia Sotomayor. And so that was the first, time. it's part of the She Persisted series. So that's exciting for me to sort of be dabbling in chapter book it's a you know it's just a different voice a different style and I, I'd like to investigate that a little bit more um, and then I'm on contract with Candlewick for two more books one will be a picture book and another will be a middle grade novel um, and I know nothing else about them right a except that <laughs> the, the those two things will come from me after I finish them the last mercy book and how about you Oh, me! I'm working on too many things at the same time. Um, <laughs> That's uh, what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but you told I, me this morning. I went, "What?" <laughs> I am getting to write some things that are in areas that I haven't written before. So that's so it's fun. Um, uh, but one thing that I I'm, haven't done yet that I would like to do um, is a mystery. Mm. I'd love to write a mystery. Mm. Um, yes. And I also, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a playwright, Renee. And like, that was what, I was, yeah, I, I was sure I was going to be a playwright. Um, I love theater. So yeah, that's another thing I thought about that I'd like to do. And um, something about an adult book about um, competitive class moms I want to do. <laughs> and um <laughs> A, book oh, about a horror <laughs> genre. A horror, a horror, a horror story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to write about a therapy cat. I don't know what this therapy cat's uh, story is yet, but I have this therapy cat character. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. That's fun. Love it. I want all of that. Yeah, I want all of it. I can't wait. <laughs> So it looks like we are at the end of our time here this evening, but I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to all three of you for this wonderful conversation. This is such a warm and thoughtful space and I'm kind of on an absolute high right now. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to hear about these characters learning and growing and establishing boundaries because I think a lot of us are sort of still <laughs> trying to learn how to do these things and it's just really wonderful to hear you talk about these these things that are still topical for your for your whole life um in the chat amy says you expressed the stress worry fear and love that so many of us are feeling it's good to know we are in this together and there was so many comments like that so audience members thank you thank you so much for being here thanks for chatting for speaking your minds i love to see everything that everyone is saying um one more huge huge thank you and of course come on in to the bookstore if you are local uh we do ship as well come in and buy some books <laughs> this is your this is your excuse i told you to <laughs> so one more huge huge thank you and let the awkward goodbye waving commence <laughs> <laughs> thanks for hosting us of course my Bye, pleasure everybody. thank you so much <laughs> thank See you everyone you later. good night good night good night, good night.